This is a particular honor for me. And in fact, I'm a little nervous I'll break into tears or something like that. Um, this is, uh, I, I have the, the great honor of, uh, of being a Neil Burton lecturer here at, U, at, at UVic. Um, I knew Neil, I, I met Neil uh, in 1970, the winter of 1974-75. I can't put a month on it, but we, we basically, we met 40 years ago. Um, Neil was, was a remarkable person, and in the earlier Neil Burton lectures, you got to you had uh, speakers, I gather, who reflected on aspects of Neil's interests. Um, his interest in the environment, his interest in the labor movement, his interest in um, uh, theory of capitalism and theories of socialism. What I want to do is, tonight is to talk about my interests, which are historical. And in, in doing so, I want to reflect on Neil as a scholar. Um, he was a remarkable but highly idiosyncratic, highly individual, and utterly wonderful thinker um, who shaped my work in ways that, that sometimes feel a little spooky. Um, I dedicated my, my last book I dedicated to Neil's memory. And it's, it's kind of an odd dedication. It, uh, I, what I wrote is... Um, well, the, this book is for my uncommon reader, Faye Sims, who's my wife and is here tonight. It is also dedicated to the memory of Neil Burton, fellow traveler, always one step ahead. Now, the fellow traveler is a bit of a joke because um, Neil and I have always been on the left, but we've managed never to be in the same place on the left. Um, you have to, if you go back to 1974, you have to think that those were very different times. The Cultural Revolution was still happening in China. Um, I was, I guess, at sort of the libertarian end of the left, and Neil was very much at the uh, actually existing state socialist end of the left. And, um, and so it kind of started out that we really didn't get to know each other. This was in Beijing, by the way, I should have said. We were both students in Beijing. And um, there was a kind of split in the foreign student community, and Neil was in one group and I was in another. And then somehow that split just dissolved between us. And somehow we became friends, and I don't think either of us could explain how it happened, except on my part, I recognize an extraordinarily talented and intelligent mind, um, deeply compassionate, and we developed a trust in each other, which, um, which has led to a lot of things in my life. I live on Salt Spring Island, and we wouldn't, my wife and I wouldn't be living on Salt Spring if it hadn't been for the fact that Neil lived there, and we used to visit him a lot. And we thought, this is a nice place to live. And so it's, um, it's with great happiness and sadness that I just wanted to recall um, Neil tonight before I start speaking. But he, he was always one step ahead. And he has a, Neil has, has an annoying way of sort of butting into my attention. Um, he's, he's done it several times in the last week. I'm working on another project on interstate relations in Asia. And I needed a quick fix on the major treaties between European powers and the Chinese. Well, Neil compiled a source book for a UVic course he taught in 2003. And a copy ended up in my house. And I was rummaging around looking for the treaties. And there, I've got Neil's copy of the treaties. You know, it's wonderful. And then there's a particular scholar, Japanese scholar named Hamashita Takeshi, an old friend of mine, who's written on the issue of interstate relations. So I pulled his book off the shelf, and who translated the first chapter of the book but Neil Burton. So I feel like Neil is everywhere. And, and I, it's wonderful, because uh, as long as I keep doing my work, he's kind of there just out of sight. And he's always doing that annoying thing that Neil used to be able to do. He'd go right to the thing that you've been avoiding, and he'd tell you about it. Now, if you're his child, this was probably a particularly frustrating skill that Neil had. But Neil had a way of just kind of thinking dialectically. He was the only true dialectician I've ever met. You know, if you say A, he's going to say, hmm, what about B? Or if you say, okay, B, then he's going to say, what about A? Um, it was annoying and absolutely brilliant. And, um, uh, and he's with me to the extent that I still have some, some uh, teaching materials and 
books that he gave to me towards the end of his life that I continue to use. So I'm, I'm very honored um, by Kathy and you, Vic, to have this chance to come up and just say a few words about Neil before I go on to the subject of my talk. The lecture I want to give tonight is an attempt to think about, and here again it's Neil all over, um, Neil's early interest was very much in Chinese socialism. Um, but in his later years, he, 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 I think he thought more about the question of how did China get to the, be in the position that the socialist revolution seemed to be necessary. And China got into that position in large part from a certain perspective because of the role of the West in sort of battering down the doors of China. And so Neil has been very interested in... Uh, and Increasingly in the last year of his life, he became passionately interested in 17th, 18th century European Chinese history, which is an area in which I work somewhat. So, um, uh, in fact, one of the maps I'm going to show you tonight is a, a reproduction from a reproduction of a map that he gave me. Um, as I said, he's always one step ahead of me. He's always thinking about what, he's always hinting to me what I should be doing next. And I really appreciate him for continuing on in this way. All right. Um, my talk tonight is about a map. This is a map that was dug out of the bowels of the Bodleian Library. This is the, uh, the building in which the Chinese collection used to be held. It's now been, uh, well, it hasn't been torn down, but it's been refurbished into an exhibition hall. But the Chinese collection, collection was kept in the basement of this building. And in early 2008, the, the keeper of the Chinese collection uh, sent a message over to my office. I was in Oxford at the time, and he said, there is something pretty amazing that has just come out of the, uh, the archives of the library. You might want to see it. And this was it. It was a map of East Asia. And as you can see, and I've, I've highlighted this with the photographs, this map was in deplorable condition. Um, it's really hard from this to see what it is. You'll, you'll, get, a, you'll get a restored view in a minute. But it's a map of East Asia. Actually, the clearest thing that comes up in this, in this reproduction is Korea. So that, that sort of long peninsula hanging down from the top of the map, that's Korea, and that's Jap Japan off to the right of it. But as you can see from the photographs, it was in absolutely deplorable condition. It had been painted uh, using ink and tempera on paper and then glued to a cloth backing and after years being rolled up in the bottom of the Bodleian Library, it was in terrible condition. But it was a very exciting discovery. The map is large. It's uh, a meter wide, one and two thirds meters long. So it's a huge wall map of East Asia. And it was exciting for me because in my, my work has been on 16th and 17th century China. This seemed to be a map from the later years of the Ming Dynasty. And it seemed to show the world much as I thought it should look. And we'll get back to this problem of what the world should look like in a minute. It took um, these two curators six months to restore the map. On the left, Robert Minty, who's the chief conservator at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Uh, on the right is uh, Keisuke Sugiyama, who is the uh, chief paper conservator um, of Japanese paintings at the British Museum. And it took a lot of work to get from this, this, this dried up, crumpled mess to what they finally produce, which is um, this map on the right. It's quite beautiful. It's not, it's not, it's, it's subtly beautiful, but completely decorated. It's full of bamboo and flowers and decorations. And as far as I can tell, most of the, most of the decoration has nothing to do with the place where it's been decorated because you can't see it very well from where you're sitting, but up there in the Gobi Desert, there's two butterflies flitting around. Um, the cartographer just thought, he's, he's going to make a really nice map with lots of lovely pictures in it. But for me as a historian of China, this map became um, a real problem because in some sense it didn't look right. If, here's the map transcribed. I had a geography student at UBC do this for me, and she basically traced the shapes on the Selden map and then put in all the key um, sites that are also marked on the map. Um, so there's Japan up in the top right, Korea next to it. 
Only a couple of sites named down at the bottom end of Japan. Uh, the Ryukyu Islands, Okinawa, are rather pronounced. You've got uh, sites in China, and then all the way down through Southeast Asia, down to Sumatra and Java. The map um, is, I think you'd have to say at first glance, you may not be familiar with this part of the world, but at first glance it looks very accurate. And um, there's a process that, that cartography students know how to do called georeferencing. You take places on a historical map, and then you reference them to places on a modern conic projection in order to test how the historical map and these places today relate to each other. And this map ended up showing a high degree of accuracy. The way my student, Martha Lee, was able to sort of get our view of East Asia together with the Selden map view was to kind of pull it apart in the middle. Um, he had, and I'll, I'm going to get back to this point a little bit later on. He kind of squeezed the South China Sea in order to um, fit uh, his vision of how this part of the world looked um, onto. And when, when, when we rubber sheet it onto our view of East Asia, it looks pretty good. It's pretty amazing. For a historian, for a map historian, this is a huge problem. Because the history of mapping isn't how people over time have come to make more and more accurate maps. Accuracy is interesting, but accuracy is only one thing <clears throat> that a map historian looks at. You also, because, because a map is really, a, it's a mental landscape as much as it is a physical landscape. <clears throat> After all, you can't, you can't stand in Shanghai and sort of look out and see where Korea and Japan are. You just can't do it. These are all mathematical uh, problems that have to be solved in one way or another. And accuracy might come into it, but um, Cordell Yi, who is the, the, the senior historian of Chinese maps, used to make a big point of saying, well, don't expect Chinese maps to be accurate. That's not why they were drawn. Well, in fact, here's a very accurate map of East Asia. How is it possible? How could it be created? And that became the puzzle that then um, induced me to write a whole book about this map. And, and I should warn you, the, the book really isn't about the map. If you're really interested in maps, this is not the book for you, because the book is really more about the people who own the map, how they read it, how it got passed around, and, and that sort of thing. Well, um, so if accuracy isn't the issue, what is the issue with this map? The issue is, how can you imagine the world in a shape utterly unlike the shape that you know the world is supposed to look like? Well, if you start from a European perspective, I've taken a map. This is a, this is a, um, uh, a digital image of a map in a book that, that, that Neil loaned to me, uh, Johann Blau's Grand Atlas of 1663. And it's roughly the same part of the world as you can see with the Selden map. You put the two of them together, neither of them is perfectly accurate. Both of them are pretty good. Um, but in fact, the Selden map is probably better. Um, Johan Blau really didn't have very good information about Japan or Korea or anywhere up the Siberian coast. He's pretty good on Southeast Asia. So the two maps are, are, are both get a kind of B in terms of accuracy. But the problem is not how did the Selden map compared to European maps, it's how did it compare to Chinese maps? According to Chinese, um, the, the Chinese cosmological design, heaven is round and the earth is square. So whenever an, a, a terrestrial form is drawn on a Chinese map, traditionally, it has to be squared off because the earth is square. Heaven is round. So Chinese don't draw or didn't draw round maps. Um, they start drawing them when Europeans start bringing round maps, but it made no sense to them that the, that the Earth would be round because it's known that the Earth is square. So this is a map of the world. Um, it's called the white map. Uh, at, like the Selden map, um, items in the Bodleian Library were given the names of the donors. So, and I'll get to John Selden later on, the man who gave the Selden map. This was given by uh, Captain White of the East India Company, he didn't, doesn't tell us how he acquired it, but it's a map from the late Ming Dynasty, and it was deposit, deposited in the Bodleian Library after he died in 1684. It's a map of the world. 
Now, if, if it's mostly a map of China, you can see the Great Wall across the top. Um, that's pretty obvious. And um, if you follow the general, uh, well, here, I think I've transcribed some of the places. Yes. So there's Beijing up at the top, Nanjing further down. Um, it's mostly China. China takes up 90% of the map. But then the rest of the world is squeezed in around the edges. So we've got Korea over there, Japan, Okinawa, Vietnam. We even have India here. Um, now, this is why historians of cartography don't like to fuss too much about accuracy, because this is clearly not an accurate map. But it, it is, if you like, symbolically accurate. That is, it, it, it expresses the, how Chinese in the Ming Dynasty thought about how the world looked from China. It's very much taken from the landmass of China looking out. So looking out, you can see that there is Japan, Ryukyu, Vietnam south of you, India's off to the west. You know about these places. You give them locations on the map. But they're not important because these are not places you go to. These are not places that mean much of anything um, except as tributaries of the Chinese emperor. So all of these states on the map, um, not all of them, but most of them would send tribute envoys every three years to China to acknowledge the Chinese emperor's supremacy. And that's what this map is about. This is really a map of the tribute system. Now, if we take the China portion of the Selden map, it actually kind of fits this heaven is round, earth as square paradigm. It, it's, it's not identical to the white map, but I found another map that it's, it's quite close to. This is a map of, of China taken from an encyclopedia, 1599, published in Fujian. It's a popular encyclopedia. Visually, it's not a very good one-on-one um, -on -one with the China portion of the Selden map. But in fact, in terms of the data, all of the place names on the 1599 map replicate all of the place names in China on the Selden map. So we have a kind of match. And in fact, the, the, the match is so good because there's some funny peculiarities in this encyclopedia map that get transferred over to the other map. The match is so close that I decided that that part of the map was drawn from an encyclopedia. That is, the cartographer who drew the Selden map did not draw, if you like, he didn't, he didn't draw China. He simply traced it from an encyclopedia, which is fine because nobody can, can draw the entire world. Um, an, an adage of map history is every map is a copy of another map. And that map is a copy of another map. So it's copies all the way down. And in this case, he's copied China in his map. And in fact, if the rest of the map had been, the rest of the Selden map had been lost and we just had that China section, it wouldn't be particularly exciting or troubling or confusing because it kind of fits in with Chinese cartographic practice. It's the rest of the map that's the problem. Because the rest of the map, there are no Chinese prototypes for everything else on the map. All right. To get a sense of why this map might have been made the way it was, I decided that rather than focus on China, I needed to move the lens down a little bit and look out to the water. Because the most important, um, or at least the most unique feature of this map compared to any other map drawn at this time of the world, with maybe a couple of Japanese exceptions, is that it traces uh, navigation routes across the bodies of water. So in fact, it's not, it, in, it, to use the, um, the English distinction, it's not a map, it's a chart. It's actually a chart of maritime routes rather than a map of terrestrial forms. So let me move in now to this section. This is the, the section along the Chinese coast. And you'll see, um, um, well, I've marked in a few place names here. I'm sorry, the, the yellow doesn't come up very well with the projection. Um, but it's, it's the coastal route. It goes from past Canton up um, to Tranzhou and Zhangzhou, the southernmost parts of Fujian. It continues all the way up to Nagasaki. And then there are other routes that go out to um, other islands. I want to focus particularly on this route. Now, the route is drawn as a series of straight, straight edge lines and occasionally the, 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 the orientation of the line shifts, but it's a continuous series of lines that mark 
um, the navigation route. Really, it's a navigation route for how to get from Nagasaki to Hanoi, and it goes right beside China. Now, I've also circled a dot there. Um, it's the only dot on the map. There's a tracery of lines that go all over the map. There's only one dot, and that dot sits off the coast of southern Fujian. So this tells me what? Well, in the preceding Yuan dynasty, Quanzhou was the major Chinese port for um, international maritime trade to the rest of Southeast Asia and into the Indian Ocean. By the time this map was drawn, that uh, Quanzhou had had to pass the baton to Zhangzhou, a little further south. Um, that became the major port of foreign trade. So what the cartographer has done, he's put a dot. I take this as the place where the map starts. This is kind of the beginning of the entire network of routes. This is where it all starts. And whether he's pointing to Tranjo or Zhangzhou doesn't really matter because they're both quite close to each other. At any rate, let me focus on this, this line. Um, curious about these lines. They're not just lines, but they also have captions. And I've circled two of the captions here. One of the captions says Gunyin, and the other one further down says Kunshan. Now, if you're Chinese, you will recognize those four characters as four of the 12 points of the Chinese compass. And in fact, that's exactly what they're doing. They are giving us compass bearings for the segments of the line beside which they are written. Now, to read those, we can move up to uh, really a remarkable feature of this map, and that is the compass rose that is drawn um, on the top of the map. Chinese cartographers did not draw compasses on their maps. And yet, here is one. And um, if we take that compass and we put it down beside, oh, here's, this is a, a modern transcription uh, of the, of the uh, sorry, 24, not 12, 24 characters that, that, that identify points on the, on the Chinese compass. Uh, north is Zhe and south is Wu. I mark them there, uh, 360 degrees and 180 degrees. Take that compass and move it down beside the line, and we can read off what the compass bearings are. Um, Gong and Yin sit beside each other on the, the upper right-hand arc of the compass, and Kun and Shen sit beside each other on the lower left-hand portion of the compass. We convert those into modern compass bearings. It's 45 and 60 degrees for Gong and Yin, 225 and 240 degrees for Kun and Shen, and for Gong Yin and Kun Shen, you split the difference. And so one line is 52 and a half degrees, and the other line is 232 and a half degrees. You can then go across the entire map reading all the compass bearings that are marked on it. And they're remarkably close to where they should be. In fact, so much so that if you'll notice that compass tilts a little bit to the left. Well, by best estimate, at the turn of the 17th century, uh, uh, magnetic north was about five degrees uh, westerly. And in fact, this is how the cartographer has drawn his compass, and that's how he's drawn the lines in the map. So if you set the map up, you treat the north, due north right at the top of the map, you'll find every, all the compass bearings have been adjusted to take, uh, to take account of the difference between true and magnetic north. So it's a very uh, accurate uh, rendition of this data. Now, the, 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 the next step in this process that sort of finishes the problem of where the accuracy comes from has to do with what happened when they took the backing off the map. I've got uh, Robert and Kaysky there working on the map. Um, the most uh, heart, sort of heart in the mouth moment in the restoration of the map was when they finally lifted the cloth backing off of the paper map. This is Marinita Stiglitz, who is Robert Minty's chief assistant in the Bodleian Library. And this is a picture of the two of them lifting the, 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 the backing off. And they wanted this photograph because they were afraid that as soon as they tried to lift it, lift it, the map would just disintegrate into a thousand pieces. But it didn't. It's good quality Chinese paper. Um, stood up, uh, no problems, the backing comes off. Well, why is this interesting? It's interesting because there are marks on the back of the map. And the, most, the, the largest one of the marks 
is this series of lines that someone has drawn across the paper. Well, this is the series of lines that are on the front side of the paper as well. What's happened? It's a little hard to guess, but the best guess I can come up with is that the cartographer started to draw root lines, the, the Nagasaki to Hanoi route. And it's kind of the main trunk route for the whole system. It's the backbone to the, to the, to the routes that go all, all over East Asia. And for whatever reason, he drew it, and then he thought, mm, not quite right. So he flipped the paper over, and he drew it again on the other side and started drawing his map. That's one guess. Another guess is he wasn't quite sure of the scale he wanted to use, so he was practicing. There was a very precise scale to the map. Maybe he was practicing on the scale just to see how it worked out. I'm not sure. But at any rate, he then turned it over, and he drew it on the other side. What does this tell us? Well, it tells us, of course, that he was using very precise magnetic directions to draw the lines. But what more, important, it, more importantly, it tells us that he drew the lines first. That the way he drew his map of East Asia was to draw navigation routes on an empty sheet of paper. Once he'd drawn all of his navigation routes, then he started to fill in Japan and Okinawa and the Philippines and China. So that, in fact, the landforms on this map are kind of secondary to the navigational information. This is important because this, is his, this is explains the source of his accuracy. Um, one of the things I've done since moving to Salt Spring, and I guess I have to thank Neil for this too, um, is I've become interested in sailing. And in fact, I've gotten my sort of basic certificate of competence on the water. And one of the things you learn very early on in sailing is you need to know exactly where you're going. And you can't sort of say, oh, we'll go that way, and if we're five degrees off, it doesn't matter, because five degrees off and you hit a rock and you sink. So um, maritime navigation requires very precise calculation. So it tells us, first of all, that Chinese mariners were making very precise calculations, which you should hope they would be doing. But it also tells us that this is the, the, the source of the, the, the accuracy of, of the overall map. And in fact, the map is not a map of East Asia. The map is a map of a set of navigation routes. And so um, the result um, is this, an extraordinarily accurate map. All right. This then got me thinking, well, what is there in the Chinese mapping tradition that might help me understand how he even thought of drawing the map in this way? And so I went looking for... Um, what I've entitled this talk, Mapping from the Water. When do Chinese cartographers map from the water? Um, and there are very few examples of mapping from the water. I found two, and this is one of them. This is a map. It's actually a copy of a copy of a copy of who know many, knows how many copies. It was published in a um, encyclo military encyclopedia published about 1621. And this military encyclopedia includes the routes that Zheng He, the famous um, eunuch admiral of the early 15th century, the routes that he took to get from China, uh, from China into the Indian Ocean. Um, so much, re I mean, re his grandfather had access to some original charts, we suspect. And so he's drawn um, Zheng He's routes. Now, the interesting thing here is that these, these maps are drawn from the water. That is, you are not standing on the land looking out to the sea. You, are, um, you stand at the bottom of the map looking up in Chinese cartography, I guess in most cartographies. So you're looking at the land from the water. This is very unusual. Um, and then once I started reading it, I saw, well, what are all of those things I've circled? They are compass bearings. So there is a prototype available. Um, who used this prototype? The, no, no original map exists showing this. As I said, this is, a cop this is many copies away from any sort of original. But there were records kept of the routes that ships took and the, the compass bearings on which they sailed. Um, and here, as a matter of fact, as we're coming down the coast, is Quinshan, which, you'll, if you'll remember, was 232 and a half degrees. It's the route going southwest past Zhangzhou and Changzhou. And that's the route that you take once you're, once you're sort of down past the Zhejiang coast. You get on a 232 and a half degree angle 
and you sail in that direction. <clears throat> now, as I say, this is kind of unusual because the conventional Chinese mapping tradition is you stand on the land and look out to water. So this is a map in which the man who drew the maps in the previous one, um, this is his, his grandfather was involved in producing maps of the coast. But these are defense maps. So a defense map is how do you prevent the invaders from attacking. It's not how do you go out on the water and do something on the water. We have a lot of these kinds of maps in the Ming Dynasty, very few of the others. But at least we know that there is a tradition of uh, mapping from the water. Now the Zhenghe maps that were reproduced in 1621, these take you all the way down the south coast, down around Southeast Asia, up through the Strait of Malacca. I'm showing you the Strait of Malacca here, the passage between the island of Sumatra, and the, which is to the southwest, and then the Malayan Peninsula in the, in the northeast. Um, so it's showing you the, the passage that uh, Chinese fleets in the 15th century took. And this is the last map. It's a very famous um, panel in this sequence of maps because this is the map showing the Arabian Sea and the Western Indian Ocean. Um, it's been suggested that it's Africa on the bottom of the map. This is certainly the Arabian Peninsula on the, on the bottom left. Uh, Aden, which is one of the three major ports on the south end of Arabia, is marked. There's the Red Sea at the bottom. And Calicut, which is a major trading center on the southwest coast of India, is also marked, with various routes um, crossing, um, crossing the, uh, the Arabian Sea. So there is a tradition. Now, did the question that I, as a historian, of course, want to ask is, I want to make a connection here. Can I make a connection? The short answer is no. I can't really make a connection. Because, well, I, 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 I hate to retreat to what seems like a kind of a weak uh, defense, but the aesthetic is different. It's drawn differently. It's visually represented in a different way. Um, the sea routes are dots. They're not lines. Did the Selden cartographer, as we have to call him, we don't have a name for the cartographer, did he see maps like this? Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe what he saw was closer to what he drew than, what these, than these maps, because these maps were drawn by people who never got in boats. These are, these are nautical charts by people who didn't sail. And so they're kind of fun to have, but they're really just sort of cartoons of, of what Zheng He's trips might have been like. They, they, they don't get us very close to the origins. However, there's kind of one interesting telltale trace on the Selden map, and that is Calicut. As I said, it's the port on the southwest coast of India. Um, a lot of trade went through Calicut. And our cartographer has put Calicut on the map, and he's put it in a what to us is going to be a very odd place. I would say it's roughly where Rangoon is today. Um, you've, come up, you've come up the, uh, the Strait of Malacca, here's Sumatra, here's the Malaysian Peninsula. You come up the Strait of Malacca, you enter the Indian Ocean, and then up the coast you come to, to Calicut. Well, you, you have to cross half of the Indian Ocean to get to India before you can even get to Calicut, and you have to get around Sri Lanka. None of that is on the map. So again, as a historian, I ask, well, what does this tell us? Well, it tells us a couple of things. One, our cartographer hadn't the faintest idea where India was. He knew it was somewhere off in that direction. Um, he did not have access to any information about uh, navigation routes in the Indian Ocean, which makes sense because Chinese, after the Portuguese move into the Indian Ocean, they pretty much chase Chinese say, uh, ships out of the Indian Ocean. So, by the middle of the 16th century, Chinese are not going any further than Malacca. And there they trade with the Portuguese, while well, the Portuguese end up taking Malacca, seizing it. Um, so the, the Chinese trading networks kind of stop at Malacca. And what's out beyond, um, they, don't, they, don't, uh, they no longer have access to. Which to me is kind of encouraging, actually, because I was hoping my cartographer was somebody who was transcribing the world that he lived in. This isn't some historical exercise. It's actually the real world of maritime trade. And the fact that he just sticks Calicut up the side and has no idea where it is encourages me to think, as, oh, he's not copying Zheng He maps. He's actually um, presenting the world as he knows it. What's fun now is 
you see there's a, a colophon, a, a box that an inscription has been put in at the side of the map, beside Calica. And uh, for those of you who read Chinese, you'll find this interesting. For the rest of you, let me just fill you in very quickly. Um, the Chinese word, the Chinese name for Calica is Guli, which I've highlighted here in red. These, these are three, uh, s- uh, three sets of directions for how to sail from Calicut to the Arabian Peninsula. One takes you to um, uh, Aden, which, I, which we've already seen is on the, the, uh, the Maoyani map. One gets you to Jafar, and one gets you to Hormuz at the mouth of the Persian Gulf. So the cartographer has stuck in here some information about what might lie beyond Calicut. And it, it really, this is not terrifically useful information. For the third one, he's able to give you compass bearings, and I've, I've highlighted those in blue. The first two, getting to Aden and, Aden and Jafar, he doesn't have any compass bearings. He just says, go northwest, and it's going to take you this many watches, and you'll get there, which is pretty useless in terms of navigational directions. The one to get to the mouth of the Persian Gulf is really good. Um, There are other sources that we can go to to sort of test uh, this. But what it tells me is that this is not not active information. And he's come across it. He's found this information about how to get to the Persian Gulf, and he figures... Well, I'm just going to stick it in the side of the map. And someday, maybe somebody will be able to use this information. The way we can test this is we go back into the Bodleian Library. The Bodleian is the... uh, There is no other map like the Selden map anywhere in the world in existence. So the Bodleian Library, up the Thames River, is the preservation of the only navigation map of Ming Dynasty. It's also the site of the only rudder of Ming navigation. A rudder is a handbook. It's a textual, uh, it's all written out in text. It tells you how to sail places. And it's all about compass bearings and where you go and how many, how many um, watches it takes. There are 10 watches in a day if you're Chinese. And this was collected by Archbishop Laud, who had the misfortune to be executed by Parliament in 1645 as in the lead up to the, uh, to the English Civil War. Um, but he was a great benefactor and donor to um, Oxford University. He becomes the chancellor at one point. Somehow, he got a copy of a Chinese root book, a Chinese maritime trade root book. And so it's called the Laud Rudder because he gave it to them. And if you go to the Laud Rudder, you discover that route to the Persian Gulf, there's some differences. It's not, a, it's not identical, but it's close enough. I think the Laud Rudder or the Selden map is get, would, would get you from Calicut to the Persian Gulf if you needed to do it. What's also interesting is that a lot of the routes that are on the map are also in the Laud Rudder. They're written out. But they're not identical, which to me is terrific. Because if they were identical, I would start worrying again that the Selden cartographer was just engaging in a sort of an academic exercise, copying out everything that's in the rudder, putting it on a map as an illustration of the rudder. But again, he's not doing that. His, there's a lot of variation between the two. So again, encouraging me to think that he's describing the world that he knew at the time that he did the map. All right. Now, um, something I resisted in the course of doing this project. The obvious thing, or, or the obvious guess to make at the beginning of the project, I look at the map, it looks an awful lot like what we think that part of the world looks like today. I've showed you the copy of the Yoen Blau. Is it a copy of a European map? And I just resisted this possibility as long as I, as long as I possibly could. Because when you put it up against the, the Yoen Blau map of 1663, well, again, if the, the problem is how do map makers make maps? Well, they copy other people's maps. Nobody starts from scratch. You copy other maps. The, the, if you like, the, the, the quick and dirty explanation for the way in which the Selden cartographer drew his map is that he'd seen a European map. And he'd think, ah, oh, so that's what this part of the world looks like. I'm going to draw one too. There's no proof one way or another. I'm, I'm, I'm still suspicious. Now, I guess I have to say, he probably did see a map at some point. And in fact, maybe that strengthens my other argument, which, this is a, which is that this is a map drawn for real purposes 
in a real context because my best guess, I'm sort of jumping ahead here, is that he actually lived in Bantam, which is a small port at the right here at the western edge of Java. It's to the west of today's Jakarta. Um, I think he was a Chinese living in Bantam. He would have met English people, Dutch people, probably some Spanish and Portuguese. This is the trading world. You talk to everybody and you talk to anybody. Um, so he probably at some point saw a European map of this part of the world. But it's only probable. I haven't been able to find an exact match. An exact match probably doesn't matter. What probably mattered <clears throat> is that he saw some, another culture's way of depicting the world. And when it came time to drawing his roots and filling in the rest, it may have helped guide him imaginatively towards being able to picture uh, the world that he couldn't see. There's another interesting telltale trace, though, that suggests a, a little bit of European influence. I showed you the compass earlier, and as I said, compasses don't appear on Chinese maps. Whose maps do they appear on? Well, they appear on European maps. When do they appear on European maps? Well, not really before the end of the 15th century. And what do compasses always appear in tandem with? A ruler or a, or, or a scale. And here that our cartographer has drawn, literally he's drawn a ruler along the bottom. And he's ticked the ruler off. The ticks actually, um, if you compare the look at the distances on the map, the ticks work out to the distance it takes to travel a 24-hour period by ship, according to a set, uh, I think it's 6.4 knots, is kind of the standard speed that the Chinese uh, maritime uh, people work with. So in fact, this is a ruler showing you, with each tick, you travel the day on the water. And it showed you, well, it was the scale according to which you drew the map and probably the scale according to which he drew all of those root lines, because each of those lines has a specific length coordinated to the number of watches you stayed on that compass bearing before you took another bearing and, and, and moved off in another direction. So a compass and a ruler on a map, well, it's hard not to think of what are called portal and charts. These are charts that start to be drawn in the 15th century. They become very popular in the 16th century. They die out in the 17th century. And the fact that we sometimes have a compass rose on a map, this is just a kind of vestigial um, sign of the early portal and charts. A portal and chart was drawn, and I'm not too good on the technology of this, but what you did is you took eight points in a circle. At each point, you drew a compass. From each compass, you radiated um, eight, 16, or 32 lines. These are called rub lines. As you draw these lines, you create a matrix of lines all across your map. And then from that, you can triangulate any position on the map according to its, its magnetic location and its distance from other things. This is how, this is how the first large-scale maps, this is a map of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, portal and charts are first drawn for coastal areas, then for the Mediterranean. Then they start using this technique to map the Atlantic Ocean. This is where the first big maps of the Atlantic Ocean are made. And there they are. I mean, you've got two of the, uh, no, I'm sorry, you see three of the eight compasses. This is actually by an Ottoman. This is not a European map. It's an Ottoman map maker um, by the name of Piri, Ahmed Muhyiddin Piri, uh, made about 16, 1513. Uh, but here you see three compasses and two rulers. And it looks suspiciously, you know, we've got this compass and ruler here. All right. I, I, I resisted this comparison as long as I possibly could. And then in the end, I realized this wasn't necessarily a problem. He probably saw a European portal and chart. If he saw a portal and chart, he would have seen that a compass was drawn on it and a ruler was drawn on it and several compasses. Whether that inspired him to do his map, I don't know. But in the end, he ends up drawing a different kind of map. He doesn't do a portal and chart because he didn't understand, or I don't know if he understood or not, but he didn't know what the geometry of drawing a Portland chart was. It's rather complex, and I can't really figure it out. I don't have the geometry for it. It's a rather complex technique. And he wasn't using it anyway. 
but he was using a compass and a ruler. And the way in which I have the sense that he was doing something very different, he's using a compass and a ruler, but he's using them differently. So he's not using them to create a matrix, um, a kind of round matrix into which he can insert the space, but he's, he's doing it to magnetize the map. So the compass tells you where magnetic north is. The ruler tells you the distances he's drawing. And as he, as he draws his, you know, 54 and a half degrees, 60 degrees, he's drawing them according to um, the compass and the ruler. As I said, he comes up with a very accurate map. The problem, and the reason why I know this wasn't an attempt at a Portland chart, was this problem that... Um, my, my research assistant from geography pointed out to me that the only way to make the Selden map work is to kind of pull it apart. That, and so why is that? Why is it that he's drawn a map that tries to be magnetically accurate and in the end fails and he has to, he has to fake it? He has to make much of the South China Sea disappear. Well, it's the problem of the curvature of the Earth. He didn't have the mathematical modeling to enable him to figure out what happens as you go around a sphere. Because um, one of the things you learn, and it's quite baffling when you first learn it when you're doing a navigation course, if you draw a straight line in any direction other than zero degrees or 90 degrees, draw a straight line in any direction on a globe, and it ends up being a spiral that either ends up at the North Pole or ends down at the South Pole. Because the nature of the sphere is that to perpetuate a line that's drawn on it, uh, you, you end up creating a spiral. It's kind of puzzling, but it actually works. It's true. Now, that's why I think the Selden cartographer wasn't able to match all his lines up. And so he, he um, I shouldn't perhaps call it cheating, but he fudges so that the lines further away from the middle of the map become more and more distorted. He can't squeeze them in because his final goal is to connect all the roots. And if he has to connect all the roots, it means they've got to finally meet in the end. And yet they're all going, starting to go wonky. And I'm, I'm, I suspect he didn't have a good explanation. Because as you know, if you, stand in, if you stand in Burma and look north, and you stand in Manila and look north, those are not parallel lines because they converge in the North Pole. And he had no way to deal with this. And so it was a very practical solution because, and I've made this point more than once to the odd Chinese who insist that the Selden map is proof that China owns the South China Sea. Um, uh, he had to make the South China Sea go away. The South China Sea was in his way if he wanted to get the lines to line up in the end. I, I'm sorry I'm going on at a, 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 bit, a bit of a long length. I'll try and keep the last portion of this talk brief. I know it's the evening. Unfortunately, I get up here and I start talking about this stuff, and I, I'm having too much fun. Um, I know some of you have to catch a ferry, so if, you, if your ferry is leaving, you know, just leave. I wanted to go to the, again, I'm going to go back to Oxford University again. I, knew, I want to tell you something about the man who collected the map, because that's one of the reasons this map becomes so interesting. Um, the Bodleian Library, this is the, the, the building that was built in, at the beginning of the 17th, uh, well, it was, a, it was it was remodeled in the 17th century to become the Bodleian Library. This is called the Selden Inn. And it's called the Selden Inn because John Selden, a prominent lawyer of the 17th century, when he died in 1654, he donated his uh, collection of uh, books, art, and maps to the Bodleian Library. And it was such a huge amount that it took up, it, it occupied much of the, of the library. So they put it at one end of the library. It's called the Selden Inn. It was the largest private collection, the largest private book collection in England at the time he died in 1654. John Selden's an interesting guy. He grew up, his son, he was the son of a farmer who had just enough land to survive on the south coast of England. He made extra money by playing the fiddle at, at weddings. Um, so a boy from very humble circumstances who was so brilliant that every teacher who ever had him kept passing him up through the system. So he enters Oxford at the age of 14, um, leaves Oxford without completing a degree in the age of 18 because he wants to become a lawyer, goes to London, hangs out with Ben Johnson and Shakespeare and you know, all of those people. Um, a fascinating guy. Now, why would somebody like this end up with a Chinese map? 
Um, he collected some pictorial materials. He did collect a lot of maps. Um, these were very hard to acquire. Um, this kind of map, it's a one-off. It's done by an artist, really. It's not just a printed map. Very hard to acquire. So why would John Selden want to have this map? Well, what I had to do was try and reconstruct how it got into his possession. And I'm going to give you a series of four steps. And each of them is going to have a question mark at the end, because we don't know. Very maddeningly, John Selden never wrote a word about the map except in his will. And in his will, he says that he has a map of China, and he said, made there, uh, and fairly done, that is, beautifully done, um, a decorated map made in China. But he doesn't tell us much of anything else. And so I tried to piece together, well, how could a map made in Asia have gotten to him? Well, he was a friend of a, uh, a publisher of traveler's tales called Samuel Perkis, who died in 1626. Perkis was the largest collector of foreign language materials in London by the time he died. Selden and Perkis knew each other. So my best guess, and he bought part of Perkis's library when he died. So my best guess is he picked it up sometime after 1626. Now, where did Perkis get it? Well, my guess is that Perkis probably got it um, around sometime before he died in 1616. Where did he get it? Well, uh, oh, uh, we know that Perkis liked to collect maps, and he got another Chinese map, and this is very much the Earth, heaven is round, earth is, squ earth is square kind of map. And he reprints it in uh, Perkis's Pilgrims, his great collection of traveler's tales um, in 1625. So he had at least another, a traditional uh, map of China. But he's got a note in there that says, we've misunderstood what China looks like. You should understand China from the Chinese point of view. I have a real Chinese map, so this is what China looks like. So his heart was in the right place. But his, um, his surveying, surveying intelligence wasn't, because well, this isn't how China looks. This is how China is represented in Chinese maps. But I, I guess nice try. Anyway, he probably got it from Richard Hacklett, who was the great collector of <coughs> traveler's tales um, before he died in 1616. And Hacklett probably got it from Captain John Saris, who was a commander of an East India Company uh, voyage about 1608. I won't go into all of the details about this. Um, I have no proof for any of this. But it's the best I can do. Um, and my suspicion is, as I said, that the map was drawn in Bantam by a Chinese. And then Selden does tell us one useful thing in his will. He said it was confiscated in payment of a debt, or rather in non-payment of a debt, by an English East India Company commander. So my best guess, I ruled out various other commanders, it's John Saris, and he collected it in, in non-payment of a debt from a Chinese merchant with whom he was dealing. Um, now, why is Selden interested? Well, at the time, um, uh, the map is probably already in England. He starts writing a treatise called, uh, it's called the Maraclausum, the Closed Sea, translated later into English as the, the, on the right and dominion of the sea. It's... Um, it's an answer to Grotius, whom you may have heard of. He's often called the father of international law, who writes this um, stirring claim that the seas are free and open to all and you should be able to sail, sail anywhere you want in pursuit of commerce. And if you are blocked, you should be able to use force in order to allow free trade to occur. Um, a very aggressive policy statement for the East India Company that was doing just this. Uh, uh, so for the Dutch East India Company. Well, the British East India Company was not having any of this because they wanted to get into the same markets. So, and John Selden, uh, who, who recognized in Grotius, one of the great minds of the age, for fun wrote the, 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 uh, the Grotius pieces called Mara Liberum, the Free Sea, and so Selden wrote Mara Claus in the Closed Sea. And the two of them get into this debate. Well, this comes to the attention of the kings of England. Um, First to Charles, uh, James I, and finally to Charles I. Charles I pays for a very handsome edition of the book when it comes out in 1635. I could throw in here that, that uh, Selden was thrown in prison twice, both by both Charles I and James I, but I won't go into that story. At any rate, he's finally released. In fact, the printing of the book is kind of a deal. 
uh, Archbishop Laud strikes this deal with the king that let's sell the note and we'll publish the book. Why does Charles I care about the closed sea? Well, he considers himself the master of the North Sea. And he wants to be able to contest any attempt by European monarchs to claim the North Sea is free because there was a very lucrative herring fishery off the east coast of the British Isles. He wants to control the herring fishery. So it's all about the right of the British to claim sovereignty over the herring uh, population. It has nothing to do with trade. In, well, it has very little to do with trade in Asia. But this is, I think, why John Selden got interested in the map, because the map is a representation of what I guess you have to call the open sea of East Asia. There were no states exercising, even attempting to exercise jurisdiction on coastal waters. This is not quite true. The Chinese did have a kind of coast guard to keep pirates from landing, but there was, there was no idea that, that anyone owned the water. The water was kind of, um, it was free, but it was also a dangerous place. So if you, if you wanted to protect yourself with the Navy and the Coast Guard, um, you certainly did that. So I think Selden was interested in seeing how a Chinese would represent this part of the world in attempting to develop his own argument. And uh, one sense I have of this that, that it interested him is that there were violent conflicts. As the Dutch move into the Southeast Asia in the 17th century, they violently seek to take over certain key harbors. And they argue that they have the right to do it because local rulers won't let them trade. And they, the, it is a right of all people to be able to trade freely. It's an early free trade argument. And so if the Sultan of Singapore is going to block them from trading, they have every right to attack and take over Singapore in order to allow free trade to arrive. Um, and this is, was a position that, um, to which uh, Selden objected. He felt that local rulers had the right to establish jurisdiction over local waters. Um, the English were also uh, very frustrated at the way in which the Dutch said, the seas are free until we arrive, and then frankly, we got here first and you have to stay out. And John Serres, who I think got the map originally, was sent specifically in 1613 to try and challenge the Dutch over their claims to, to, to a kind of monopoly over Southeast Asian uh, spice trade. Well, this then has another, a final twist that I'm going to give the story. John Selden became a member of Parliament for Oxford. He sat in the Long Parliament of 1640, and if you'll remember, the Long Parliament is when Parliament refuses to recess and sets out a series of increasingly difficult conditions on Charles I. It all has to do with taxation. That the king is, according to British constitutional law, the king has no right to tax without the consent of parliament. And so this is, this is a, there's a list of uh, five demands that are sketched out right at the beginning of the long parliament. And one of, number two is that the king hath not power to lay any imposition upon foreign, much less homebred commodities, though with the consent of the merchants, without consent of parliament. So this becomes, the long parliament becomes the showdown, if you like, between the commercial interests of a suddenly booming London and the interests of uh, royal privilege. And Selden is the guy who's kind of at the forefront of the struggle. Because for Selden, um, kings were a convenience, but they had no divine right. In fact, that's what gets him thrown in prison the first time with James I. He says kings have no, he doesn't say it. He says bishops have no divine right, but it doesn't take long for you to figure out, well, if bishops don't have a divine right, then kings don't have it either. So Selden was right in the middle of these struggles, and it's the struggles at which, if you like, the commercial, the rising commercial interests in London are taking over England, um, are remaking the monarchy into a constitutional monarchy, which is a monarchy that has to pay attention to the financial interests that dominate London. And then this will become the, 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 the dynamic uh, combination that will lead the British to eventually go out and create the British Empire. So John Selden is all part of that story, and I, and I, think the Selden, I like to think that the Selden map fits in here. I'm going to finish you up with a little, uh, a little postscript here. Um, one of the differences you'll have noticed between the Blau map and the Selden map is that, well, it's full of images of ships. 
And I could have shown you Chinese maps. The Chinese maps start having images of ships too. But this is the way the world is changing at the beginning of the 17th century. This is where wealth and power is now coming from. It's not over how much land you control. It's how many ships do you put on the water. Um, and this is how the world is changing, just at the time the map is being made. But one of the problems we've had in the standard account of all of this is that we tell the story of European explorers getting on ships and going out around the world. And in fact, that's a tiny part of the story. Chinese ships, Chinese were getting on ships and going out around at least um, all of East Asia and were making it possible that European, when Europeans arrived that they had somebody to trade with. Because if the Chinese didn't already operate an extensive maritime trade, the Europeans would have had nowhere to bring their ships. They would have had nothing to trade. They would have not had a lot of the labor. Many of the European ships in these waters are being manned by Chinese, Malay, and Japanese sailors. Um, but the story, because it's the, the story of, is, is usually told from the European perspective, and it sort of missed the whole thing. So that's why the subtitle of my talk today was the Chinese enlargement of the world in the 17th century. We usually think of Europeans somehow as opening up the world, and, uh, but if it weren't for the Chinese, it wouldn't be happening. A final note, there's a funny fish or a whale or something here, and I'm going to leave you with this image. This is a bowl made in Zhangzhou, the center of the Chinese maritime trade, made about 1620. It's got a strange-looking ship, it's got a strange-looking flying fish. Um, in the middle, uh, so, so it's got your elements from a European map. In the middle of the bowl is a Chinese compass, but radiating out from the compass are European rum lines from Portland charts. I think the guy who painted this bowl really wasn't trying to be, to do some kind of creative scientific hybrid. He was just using visual elements that came to hand. And he knew these were bowls to sell to foreigners. What are foreigners like? Well, let's look at a foreign map and see what they've got printed on. They've got ships. They've got flying fish. They've got these strange lines that come out from their compasses. <clears throat> he didn't know the difference between a European and a Chinese compass. It didn't matter. He sticks a Chinese compass in the bottom of the bowl. That will suit. But there's a, there's a, kind, of, uh, a kind of happy, abundant hybridity about this image that I like very much. And this, is, this makes me think kind of as a final thought of... Um, um, a concept that's been very popular in, in North American history uh, from Richard, that Richard White coined about oh, 15 years ago called the middle ground, that um, when cultures meet, they ha usually have to find a middle ground with each other. Rarely is one culture strong enough to come in and simply dominate another one. They have to meet. They have to create common ground. That common ground will get destroyed pretty quickly, and one of uh, Richard White's arguments is that is that European cultures very quickly destroy the native cultures with which they have created common ground when they first come to, to the Americas. You can make something of the same argument here, that European uh, traders are coming into East Asian waters, and there is a period of creating common ground. They rely on each other. They need each other. There's no sense that, that the Europeans are going to take over uh, more than the occasional port. They're, this is not... Uh, this is not a, 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 an era of conquest. It's an era of kind of discovery and rediscovery. It's only once you get to the 19th century and Europeans have, I don't want to make a simple technical argument here, but Europeans have ships that are sufficiently well armed that no Asian ship can counter them on the water. It's only at that point that the common ground disappears. And it's at that point that Neil Burton's interests come into play because Neil was... Neil was increasingly interested in this early 17th, 18th century period, but for him it was the 19th century. It was the imperial, Western imperialism of the 19th century that really um, pulled the, the, the entire structure out from under the Chinese world. <clears throat> and in his view, it was only something as radical as a communist revolution that was going to allow China to somehow reassemble itself. Well, in some ways, that's past. And I don't know, maybe we're now at a point in 2015 that we're all now looking for common ground again. China is now, hands down, the largest industrial producer in the world. Uh, Chinese ships are out on the oceans. Um, the West is increasingly uncomfortable with, with China's reasserted presence. I think Chinese are somewhat uncomfortable with this as well. We're all living in this period of, 
of, of not quite sure where China and the West fit together. And um, I wish Neil were still with us because if he were here tonight, I'd ask him and he'd probably come up with an absolutely brilliant formulation of how we should all see this in the very long stretch of history. This is simply a moment and it too will pass. Thank you. Wow. <laughs>